Great. Thank you, Avi. And uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Adler, for the invitation, for making this uh, possible. Uh, and indeed, that's what those, those two years here were fantastic. In fact, that's where my um, uh, fascination or obsession with uh, lattices started uh, during those years and the encouragement that uh, Avi gave me. So that was, and that's uh, uh, a lot of what I've been doing since then. Um, so I'd like to tell you a bit about those objects, about those uh, lattices. And this is, you already see it here in the background. Um, those are just regular um, uh, sets of points in space, and they've been recently showing up in a lot, a lot of different places. So I'll try to convince you why we care about them so much and why they're so nice. Um, and I should say the first part, uh, most of the talk will be based on joint work with uh, Daniel Dadush and uh, Noah Stefan Davidovich, who's actually a postdoc here this, um, this year. Um, so what are lattices? So here is a lattice uh, of lattices, uh, that just to practice my accent. So this was one of my uh, tongue twisters, a lattice, lattice. Um, if you visit us in New York, you'll see that. In, uh, it's a new public art project in Madison Square Park. Maybe some of you have seen it. Go before it's too cold. Um, uh, Erwin Riedl is an Austrian uh, artist. And you can see here, there's uh, lots of little light bulbs hopefully uh, energy-saving light bulbs uh, arranged in this lattice-like structure. It's very nice. You can see it there. Uh, so Madison Square uh, Park. Um, but lattices are really everywhere. Um, and I was happy to find them also in a paper by Irving Adler. Um, uh, and he was interested in um, uh, phyllotaxis. That's the arrangement of leaves uh, and plants. And uh, one of the figures uh, in the paper talks about uh, parasticus, which are those uh, arrangements, uh, cylindrical arrangements. So it's not quite a lattice, but maybe if you look at it up close and ignore the cylindrical structure of the pineapple, uh, you will get to see some lattice in here. So that's, um, that's another place uh, where lattices show up. Um, so maybe slightly more uh, formally, let's, let's define uh, what a lattice is. So, um, generally, we we'll think of them in, in n dimensions. Uh, it can be in two dimensions, three dimensions, or more. Um, uh, and it's just a, a set, the set of all integer combinations of n linearly independent vectors. Okay? So um, usually, when you define the linear span, you would take all real combinations. And here, we just take all integer combinations. So in this case, I would take maybe this example. You have v1, v2. And I would take all the integer combinations, so I get this infinite grid of points, uh, in this case in two-dimensional space. So those are two vectors, v1, v2, and here's twice v1, v1 plus v2, and so on and so forth. Okay? Maybe a more mathematically mature way of defining it is a discrete subgroup of Rn that's equivalent. Um, and those vectors, I would refer to them as a basis. But for the purpose of this talk, just think of that as the, uh, think of it as a grid of um, of points in in in, our, in n dimensional space. Now, what is the most famous lattice? The one we usually think of when when people t talk to us about lattices, where well, it's, it's this one, Z n, the, the lattice of integers, uh, and that would actually play an important role in this talk. You'll see later why. And all other lattices are just linear transformations of this specific one. So Z n is is the most famous one and will be actually quite important in this talk, even though it's a boring lattice, right? It's nothing very interesting about it, but you'll see, we think it might be actually quite important. Okay, so again, if, uh, I should have said, if there are any questions, interrupt me. Um, I'll um, try to make it as um, easy to follow as possible. So history, th those things, those lattices have been around for a long time. Um, those are geometric objects that have rich mathematical structure. I'll tell you in a minute where they show up. Uh, maybe the earliest interest is uh, work of Lagrange, Gauss, uh, Hermit, and Minkowski. Uh, Minkowski will play an especially important role in this talk. Um, they cared 19th century, they cared about number theoretic questions. So, for instance, Lagrange's for uh, uh, square theorem, you can write any uh, positive integer as a sum of four squares. You can prove it easily using lattices. So, if I, you know, unless I made a mistake, 310 is, is the sum of those uh, four squares, and you can write any positive integer that way. So algebraic number theory, those are the kind of questions that people cared about in the 19th century. And you'll see uh, our interests nowadays are uh, also that, but also some uh, slightly different. So where, where are they used? Um, where are lattices used? In mathematics, uh, sphere packing, 
or geometry of numbers is this area that has to do with in investigating lattices. Uh, and this will be the main topic of today's talk. So you'll hear a lot about this. Um, a lot of, uh, uh, of the interest came from algebraic number theory in the early work. Maybe I'll mention, I'm not sure if I'll mention that. Um, it will come up implicitly, uh, the Ophantan approximation. Cryptography is one thing I'm hoping to mention towards the end, if you still have the energy. This is something that's been occupying us in, in the uh, computer science or cryptography community for about a decade. And this is, seems like it's really becoming big. So it seems like maybe in a few years, all your cell phones will run lattice-based uh, cryptography. I'm hoping so. That's currently the, the hope. Lattices can allow you to encrypt things in a more secure way. Uh, and also a more versatile way. You can do many things you couldn't do before without lattices. So if we have time, I'll get back to it towards the end, show you why lattices are so nice in cryptography. Um, but the main focus of the talk will be on um, the geometry of numbers and the mathematical side. Um, in computer science, we use lattices in integer programming, uh, computational complexity. Um, in, more interesting, maybe engineering, uh, where in recent years you see interest from the IEEE community. Um, the interest there comes from wireless communication networks. Uh, in wireless communication nowadays, often you have several antennas, um, uh, and that's called this diversity. And, and what happens there is because you receive signals from several antennas, you actually end up with a multi-dimensional signal, and that is has helped you decode and encode in a very efficient way. So many of the standards, the new standards for uh, uh, communication, actually are based on uh, use lattices to encode. Um, but that's not the topic of today's talk. So those, again, lattices show up in lots of different areas, and we'll try to stick with the mathematical part and maybe say a few things about uh, cryptography, OK? So let's go back in history. And this is a question that's been around probably from millennia, uh, not, uh, not written, but it's been on, people probably knew about this for millennia. Circle packing, that's uh, the easiest case of sphere packing, two-dimensional case of sphere packing. Um, and that's something I did with my daughter, trying to pack uh, quarters uh, in, the most, in the most efficient way, the highest density. And you've probably seen that before. If you take circles, the best way is to pack them in this hexagonal fashion. Okay? So this hexagonal packing is indeed the densest. It's something like almost 91% dense, in the sense that, the, that those holes are very small. Only 10% of the space is, 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 is occupied by the holes. Um, the first proof uh, um, is by two in 1892, but probably the, the right proof or the, the rigorous proof came actually much later by uh, Feyerstadt in 1951. But it's, the proof is not very difficult in this case. So a two-dimensional case is quite well understood. Uh, and this is really the densest way to pack coins, in case you, you weren't sure. Um, intuitively, it seems uh, obvious, but you still have to prove it. And there's, there's a nice proof for that. Uh, let me just demonstrate this. Um, uh, if you don't believe that this is the tightest way, so I, what I try to do here, except uh, you know, apart from dazzling you with, <laughs> with the animation, um, I try to show two things. I'm trying to show you two things here. So what I'm doing here, I'm changing the set of centers. I'm changing the lattice. And for each lattice, let me stop that. And I apologize if uh, you suffer from the optical illusion of the point going backwards. <laughs> um, OK, let me stabilize a bit. So um, what I want to demonstrate here is that if I fix a lattice, I fix a set of points, a set of centers, the largest coin I can pack in there is exactly, the radius is exactly half of the length of the shortest vector. OK? So that, that should be obvious. I try to pack bigger and bigger coins. And the biggest coin I can pack is exactly half of the length of the shortest vector, because then it would start touching each other. So this point here and the circle you see here, identifies the shortest vector. We call it lambda, lambda of L, the first minimum of the lattice. And you can see maybe here again. Um, so this is the shortest vector. And the coin you can pack, or the circle you can pack, is exactly half. Its radius is exactly half the length of the vector. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Um, another thing maybe I want to uh, demonstrate here, in this animation, I, I, contrary to packing coins, I did not fix the size of the coin. What I did, actually, I fixed a number of lattice points. It's the same. It's equivalent. But this would be more convenient for me later. So I can fix, if you look at it again, I fix a number of lattice points, the density of lattice points. What changes here is only the size of the sphere. And that's equivalent. You can, if you wish, you can fix the size of the coin, or you can fix the, the density of the lattice points. Okay. 
both formations are equivalent, and I'll mention in, in a minute, I'll mention more formally. Okay. So let's go to the three-dimensional picture, which is more interesting, more complex. So in three dimensions, there is uh, the structure called face-centered cubic, and that's what you see when you um, pack oranges or pack balls, and you get this structure. It's basically hexagonal packing in one layer, and then the next layer is another hexagonal packing shifted by the amount, by the right amount. So that's something that Kepler uh, suspected or conjectured is the densest. It provides seven, roughly 74% density, um, but uh, it's surprisingly hard to prove. Uh, right, you would think this is probably very easy, but surprisingly hard to prove. Um, Gauss in 1831 could show that this is indeed the densest, but only if you restrict to packings that use lattices as your centers. You could imagine some other crazy packings where one ball is here, one ball is there. They don't have this regular grid structure, and Gauss didn't know what to do with that. Obviously, it seems intuitively you would want them to have this regular structure, but Proving that is extremely hard, exceedingly hard, and uh, achieved by Hales in 98 and, and the full, uh, maybe full rigor in 2014 when he had the computer assisted proof. It's a very difficult proof, uh, uh, lots of cases to uh, verify, um, and, but it's proven. So we, know, we do know now that the densest packing of oranges is this, the one that you would uh, think of, this uh, face centered cubic, and achieving that 74% density. So, um, recently, there's been some progress, nice progress on this question, higher dimensions. Um, some of you might have heard that last year, Vyazovska managed to resolve the question eight dimensions. So it's a big breakthrough. Uh, it was open for many years, and the eight dimensional case is resolved. We know that there is a structure, a lattice called E8, and that is the densest in eight dimensions. And then a year later, um, together with co-authors, they proved a 24-dimensional case is achieved by another lattice called the Leech lattice. Um, those two dimensions are very special. There's, those are very nice dimensions where, for some reason, you get those highly symmetric lattices that have fantastic properties. Those, this E8 and Leech lattice are extremely nice. And like, if we had a choice, we probably want to live in eight-dimensional space, not three-dimensional space. But that's <laughs> tough, you know, tough life. So. Those are, um, those are um, uh, two recent results resolving the eight dimensional and 24 dimensional case. Okay, so this, um, before moving on, I, should, I, I want to give you a more uh, precise definition of uh, sphere packing, just so we, can, we have the right terminology. So um, I'd like to use this, uh, I'd like to introduce just one definition, and that, that definition captures the number of lattice points per volume, the one I was mentioning before. It's called determinant. More precisely, the volume per lattice point. So you could imagine, you know, each point here occupies, kind of is, you know, owns a certain uh, region in space, and that, that is called a determinant. So there are several ways of defining it. I'll show you a few, but intuitively it's what you think of it. Uh, of it. It's just the volume kind of uh, given to any lattice point. Okay, so the, that gives you some kind of a notion of the density of the lattice, how many points you have per volume how many lattice points per volume. So one way to define it is to take a ball of some radius r, uh, make r bigger, uh, make it bigger, and let it go to infinity, uh, and then define the determinant as the limit as r goes to infinity of the volume of the, of the ball div divided by the number of lattice points inside the ball. Okay? So again, that's going to give you the volume per lattice point. Okay, that's called determinant. Um, the reason it's called determinant is because you can actually write it uh, as determinant, as a determinant of a matrix. Because if you take a basis now, so B1, B2 is the basis of this lattice, and consider the matrix whose columns are the BIs, the basis. Um, if you remember, the determinant of a matrix corresponds to the volume, in this case area, of the parallel pipe generated by the vectors, the column vectors or to be precise, the absolute value of the determinant. So this is, this is what we get here. And that's the reason for the name determinant, because it just happens to be the determinant uh, or the absolute value of the determinant of the basis. Okay. But the way I really want you to think about this is not as determinant, but really as this volume per lattice point. Okay, this intuitive uh, concept, this intuitive idea of the amount of volume each lattice point occupies. So now finally, we can define sphere packing uh, formally. Uh, or I should say, this, this measures, as I was saying, the global density of the lattice. Okay, so if, if the determinant is small, it means you have lots of points um, because uh, there's less volume per lattice point. So now we can finally define sphere packing more precisely, and this is one way to define it. 
Um, so we're trying to minimize overall lattices with shortest vector being one. So shortest vector being one means that we can pack coins of radius one half. Okay, so we, we, now in this case, I'm fixing the size of my coin. I have a coin of radius one half. And I'm minimizing over all lattices that have shortest vector of length one. What am I minimizing? Minimizing the determinant. I'm trying to have it as dense as possible. I want to have as many lattice points as possible in a given volume. Okay, so this is, this is maybe the one way of defining sphere packing, maybe the first one you would think of. Again, I'm trying to minimize the determinant, make the lattice as dense as possible while still being able to pack my quarters, my, my radius one half balls. The, another definition equivalent uh, would, would be by fixing the determinant and, letting, uh, and trying to maximize the size of the coin that I can pack, or size of the ball that I can pack. Uh, so that's completely equivalent, just different scaling. And that's the way actually I want to think about this. And that's the, what I did in the animation before. I fix a number of points per area, and I want to maximize the size of my coin or my ball. And equivalently, it's max uh, um, over all lattices of the fixed density, the determinant one. I'm trying to maximize lambda one. I'm trying lambda of L. I'm trying to maximize the length of the shortest lattice vector. Okay, is that, is that clear? So that's the way I wanted to think about this. Um, and now it's time we can finally prove our first theorem. Uh, and the first theorem, theorem is actually a theorem by Minkowski. And the question is, how big can that be? How big can uh, lambda of L be? And what I show you is that lambda of L cannot be bigger than square root n. And here is the reason. Well, it just simply because density, the density of a packing, can never be more than 100%. Right? I showed you, like, you know, 90%. But it can never, obviously, not be bigger than 100%. What this, what this means is that the biggest um, uh, ball I can pack in the lattice of determinant 1 is a ball of volume 1. If the ball has volume 1, that's the biggest I can pack. So obviously, I cannot pack balls of volume bigger than 1. That means that the shortest vector in the lattice okay, cannot be bigger than twice the radius of such a ball. Because if lambda L is bigger than twice the radius of such a ball, then I can pack balls of volume bigger than one, and that doesn't make sense. Okay, packing can, uh, the density of the packing density cannot be bigger than one hundred percent. So, equip with that, we can finally uh, prove the first theorem, Minkowski's theorem, and it says it says the following. It says that this uh, expression here is at most square root n. Okay, it says that you can never hope in the lattice of determinant one, you can never hope for the shortest vector to be further away than square root n. And, and let's just do the calculation. All you have to observe is that the volume of a ball of radius square root n over 2, right? That's, that's the ball I'm considering here. It's bigger than 1. So once you, once you see that, once you see that in n-dimensional space, the volume of a ball of radius square root n over 2 is bigger than 1, then you get that this is at most square root n, okay? Because you cannot pack balls of uh, volume bigger than 1 in determinant 1 lattices. And the, w the reason the volume is like that is you can see it in the diagram here in this uh, illustration here. If this is a ball of radius square root n over two, I can inside it I can place a, a cube of side length one. So the cube is minus one half one half to the power n. Okay, that cube obviously has volume one, and also it's obviously contained inside a ball of radius square root n over two, right? Because the point. In this cube, the point that's furthest away from the origin is, the, say, the all one half point. And the norm of that point is square root n over 2. So that cube has volume 1, hence this ball has volume bigger than 1, hence this ball cannot be packed in any lattice of determinant 1, hence lambda is always at most square root n. Okay, this is Minkowski's theorem. Uh, it's a very important theorem, I think, uh, the, one the, the most fundamental theorem in, the, uh, in this area of geometry of numbers. Um, Another way of seeing it, let me just put it in a slightly different way. If you fix the determinant to be 1, and then you consider all, you know, take a ball of radius square root 10 around the origin, Minkowski tells you, you will see some points there. You will start seeing lattice points as you go out to distance square root 10. Okay? So this is Minkowski's theorem. And actually, let's make it slightly more precise. Um, Minkowski's theorem, if you just do the proof a bit more carefully, what you get is something slightly stronger, and this is strictly speaking, Brickfeld and uh, von der Korpus. And what they showed is that um, if you take a lattice with determinant 1 and now take a ball of radius square root n, so what I showed you before is that inside, the number of lattice points you have is at least 
It is two, because you have the origin, it's always there, and you have one extra point. That's what I told you before. In fact, what you can show is slightly more care. You can show actually there are lots of points. There are two to the n points in a ball of radius square root n. OK, so this is Minkowski theorem, the way I wanted to think of it. And this is what Minkowski tells us um, in 1891, that the global density, in the sense that if you know the determinant is 1, you know that if you look from you know, 10,000 feet, you see one lattice point per volume. So Minkowski tells you then you must also have local density, in the sense that if you just look at a small ball of radius square root n, you already start seeing lots of lattice points inside it. Okay. So that's, that's one way to, un to interpret Minkowski theorem. Okay? So globally, if it's dense, uh, if the determinant is 1, then also locally, just look at radius square root n, you start seeing lots of points. So this is a very important theorem. Many results are, are based on it. It's, um, but the proof, as you saw, the proof is not very difficult. Again, a fundamental, uh, fundamental theorem in the area. So what got us interested in this um, is, is the following attempt to get the converse of this statement. Okay, so in 1891, Minkowski asks, is it true that global density implies local density? And then, a century later, <laughs> um, Daniel came as postdoc uh, to our department and asked the following question. He asked, is the converse also true? Is it true that uh, local density also implies um, global density? So it, you have to think a bit to make sense of this question. Uh, and then let's try to make sense of this question. Basically, you want to say something like that. The first attempt, it, it will not work, but let's try to make sense of this. Maybe, maybe what he wanted to ask is, if a lattice has more than 2 to the n points, say, I should have said 2 is not the best constant here, but I'm from computer science, so whenever I can, I would put a 2. Uh, but it's actually there's a different constant here. But that's for simplicity, stay, stick with 2. If a lattice has more than 2 to the n points in the ball of radius square root n, does it necessarily have the determinant less than 1? Okay, so that's one naive attempt to make sense of it. Let's just reverse the, the statement. Let's assume we're looking at the ball of radius square root n, and there are tons of lattice points inside it. Does it mean that also globally, if you look from 10,000 feet, the lattice is dense? It means that there are really lots of lattice points per volume. And just think of it for a minute, and, uh, and you'll see this cannot possibly be true. OK, so for, um, do you see why? Exactly. So. Um, one thing you can do, you can construct the following lattice. It's extremely dense on those uh, you know, uh, one-dimensional uh, subspace and its cosets, but in between, it's even more sparse. So the distance between those lines is uh, even larger. So something like that. Let's make this epsilon. The distance between the points on line are epsilon. Make the distance between those lines um, 1 over epsilon squared. And what this makes, what this, what this causes is the determinant is actually very large. This is a very sparse lattice. You think there are lots of points here, but as you go far, you see, oh, there's huge spaces, like, you know, light years, something uh, between them. Probably it's actually, it's actually very sparse. This is a very sparse lattice because the determinant is, is so high. However, obviously, if you look at the ball of radius square root n, you see tons of points. Okay? There are so many points close to the origin. Locally, it's very dense. So this seems to contradict what we were trying to say here. Because there are lots of points, but we didn't find the right explanation. It's not because the lattice is globally dense. So what do we do? We go back to Daniel and ask, what, what did you actually mean? And uh, here's what he actually meant. So what he meant to ask is this. If a lattice has more than 2 to the n points in a ball of radius square root n, then what he wants is to find a sub-lattice. He wants to find a subspace in which the determinant is less than 1. So as we saw in the previous example, maybe the determinant of the whole thing is indeed high. Okay? It's not globally, it's not dense. But if you just restrict to a subspace, then you finally understand why there are so many points. So what we want to show is that there exists some subspace. It might be one dimensional, might be you know, n over two dimension. We don't know what dimension. It can be any dimension. You can extend this example to any dimension. But we want to identify somewhere a subspace that's dense, where the determinant is small. Okay. And this is this is what we actually uh, uh, what we actually prove. So local density, it doesn't imply global density. The determinant does not have to be small, but in a subspace, you can always identify a subspace where uh, determinant is, is small, where it's dense globally inside the subspace. Okay? So this example I showed you before of, uh, of, of a very uh, dense line, 
is, is actually, this is the only thing that can cause so many points to show up close to the origin. So this reverse Minkowski theorem, let's just make it more precise, slightly more precise, and also stating it in the contrapositive, because that's the way I usually like to think of it. So what I show you is this, what we actually end up, end up showing is, if you have a lattice, yeah, I'm not sure how that happened, but <laughs> if you have a lattice, and, 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 and all sub-lattices at least one, because okay, it's a contrapositive, there's no dense subspace. So if all sub-lattices have determinant at least one, then any ball you take of radius r, so think of r you know, being something, you know, some small number, um, um, has at most that many points of, of that norm. So any ball of radius r has at most that many points inside it. So it's, a, it's an upper bound on the number of points that can be contained in a ball. And Minkowski's theorem is a lower bound. Minkowski's theorem tells us that you'll have at least two to the n points in a ball of radius square root n. It's an upper bound, saying, assuming you don't, assuming the determinant is fine, assuming that global densities are fine, you can expect only that many points of norm at most r. That's the highest number you can hope to have. Okay? So, Good. So let's skip to remark number two. <laughs> this is nearly tied for Zn. In fact, for all R. So take Zn, the, the boring lattice I had before, and let's just try to figure out how many integer points there are of norm R. And if you think about this, let's just take 0, 1 vectors. And the number of 0, 1 vectors is n choose R squared, roughly, because you can choose R squared once, and that would give you norm r. Okay, this is L2 norm of a vector with r squared once, the L2 norm is r, okay, because it's square root. So what, what you can see is the number of points, integer points, of norm at most r is n choose um, uh, r squared, and that gives us uh, e to the, some constant, e to the log n times r squared. Okay, so n to the r squared roughly, or e to the log n r squared. And that's not that far. Here's log squared n, here's log n, so it's nearly tight, uh, but it's still not quite there. But this is already um, has uh, some nice applications, which I'll mention later. So we, we still have this log n gap in the exponent, but we do have a bound that's not too far from what is known for Zn. And the first remark I skipped is that those lattices actually have a name, as we realize later. Um, those lattices are called um, stable, uh, and if you want to know more about this, you can ask Peter. Um, those lattices come from some uh, um, uh, work in algebraic geometry, uh, and they, uh, uh, this notion shows up in several uh, branches of mathematics. But for our purposes, stable just means this, just means that um, all sublattices have determinant at least one. A and also, the determinant itself should be one, but let's, let's ignore that. Theorem. Say again? Okay. <laughs> right. right. I still have, yeah. So uh, the question this raises for us, the interesting question we're trying to figure out uh, and we don't know is whether Z is the densest. Um, and this would be extremely nice if we could show that, but we still know there. Uh, and I'll show you later why this would be so nice. So we're trying to figure out, is, is this really the right number? Is Z really, maybe Z is just. Maybe. Maybe it's really extreme. Not even approximately. Not even approximately, yeah. Maybe it's just the best, so yeah. Just the worst. The worst just the worst, yeah. From, from the other point of view. Yeah, it's the worst lattice. This is exactly my, my next point. If you look at this area, I look at the work in the last um, you know, century, and people usually try to find very good lattices, very good packing, things that you don't want to have any lattice points close to the origin. If you use it for you know, for uh, coding, for wireless communication, or for mathematics. Usually you, you want lattices that are nice, that are highly symmetric. And here it seems like so far, the question we're asking is a question about the worst lattices. We want, we want to have as many points as possible close to the origin. In some sense, it's the worst possible lattice. And it seems like maybe Zn is indeed the worst possible lattice, as far as we know. But um, we'll I'll get back to this in a few slides. So this is, this is the main question we're, that we'll, uh, we'd like to, uh, to understand. Um, again, this is something interesting going on here. It's kind of the reverse question of what people have been usually looking at, really trying to understand the worst, uh, the worst lattice. And you'll see later why actually this is, um, this is useful. So 
I'm not going to do the proof here. Uh, maybe just one slide, just demonstrate uh, how it might go, how the proof roughly goes. And this is inspired by the astrophysics workshop in a building uh, across the, the, the street here. Um, so uh, we're trying to prove some bound, upper bound, on the number of points uh, a lattice of that form, a state, what we call a stable lattice, can have. And you can imagine some kind of heat map showing for each point here, each point being a lattice, showing the number of lattice points that this lattice has of norm at most r. So basically, all we're trying to do is bound from above a function on the set of lattices. So you know, you can imagine maybe the densest lattice is actually here. Maybe this is the densest lattice, and it has the largest number uh, of points of norm at most r. If this is the case, if it happens to be at the boundary, we're actually very happy. Because if you happen to be on the boundary of the set, of the set of stable lattices, it means there is some sublattice of determinant exactly one. It means that this inequality actually holds with equality. And then we can uh, continue by induction. You can just take the sublattice and prove it there. So this is one case. The other case, more interesting case, is that the maximum is somehow achieved in the middle. Maybe there is some lattice here in the interior of this set that maximizes the number of lattice points of normal to most r. In this case, it's, it seems it's not clear how to proceed. And what ends up happening is that you can, because it's, it's a maximum, because it's a local maximum, you can analyze its properties. And it turns out that those lattices that are local maxima must satisfy some interesting properties. More precisely, there, if you look at their, uh, it's called the Voronoi cell. The Voronoi cell of the lattice might, must satisfy some interesting properties. Uh, and then you can, uh, what we end up doing is using some quite heavy hammers uh, from an area called um, convex geometry using tools developed over several decades. So we, we are very fortunate to be able to use those tools. People like uh, Tom Chuck Jägerman, um, uh, uh, Figiel, uh, Pizier, and others that proved very interesting uh, statements about convex bodies like this one um, that are in certain positions that, uh, like we have here. So I won't say any more about the proof. This is a proof by picture. Instead, let me go on to talk about applications and why, why you care about this theorem, why you should care about this theorem. So there are lots of applications I'm listing here. I only want to show the first two be, um, because I think those are uh, nicest and easiest to explain. Um, there are other applications listed here. Um, maybe I just mentioned one. Turns out this answered the question of Ben Green on, on, on the f some variant of the Freiman Rougeau conjecture. But this is, this is for a later discussion. So um, let me tell you a little bit about those two applications. Maybe uh, uh, just a few slides about the first one. It's a question that um, Salof Kost asked some years ago. Uh, let me show you by picture what he asked. Okay, so this is a natural question about Brownian motion. So he said, let's take. Um, a lattice and start the Brownian motion from lattice points. Okay, so after a second, this is a two-dimensional lattice, and your position might be close to lattice point after a second. Okay, after two seconds, of course, the Brownian motion continues and it becomes further out from the lattice. Okay, after four seconds, start look like that, like an egg carton, and 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 after maybe eight seconds, it really looks like that. So this is true. Uh, that's the density, yeah, that's, that's the exact density after you know, eight time steps um, of, of the Brownian motion, the, the, the location of the Brownian motion after eight seconds. And you can see it becomes extremely close to uniform. And what Sal, of course, asked is, is trying to compare two extreme ways of quantifying what it means to be close to uniform. One way is the L infinity sense, point wise. I want point wise my density to be close to one. That's one extreme, very strong way of. Uh, 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 defining close to uniform. The other, the weakest, one of the weakest sense is to say we are close in L1 distance. I want the integral of the absolute value from uniform to be small. And he asked basically, are those two things the same? Is, th is it true that the time it takes to be mixed in the uh, L1 sense is essentially also the time it takes to mix in the L infinity sense? And turns out, using the inverse Minkowski, you can, you can essentially get there. You can show that the two are very close. Okay, so. This is one example of an application. Um, and let me now switch to the, unless there are questions. This is a good time for questions. Is it about just flat tori or more general? It's just for flat tori. Yeah, he, true. He, uh, his question was actually more general. Other manifolds, he was asking quite a general question, but also specifically about that. Um, and even here, we don't have the exact answer. We need a constant gap. We only have a log dimension gap, log n gap. Um, um, 
And now let me switch to uh, another question, another application, and that again takes us back to Minkowski's time. So this is a conjecture of Minkowski. Um, um, actually, it's not clear if he made it, but at least already in the 20s, people refer to it as his conjecture, so maybe he did it. Uh, maybe he didn't make this conjecture. And the conjecture says the following thing. Okay, so he said, take any lattice and let's normalize it to have determinant one. So density, global density is one. There's one lattice point per volume, per unit volume. He asked, is it true that for all points in space y, there exists an x in the lattice that's close in this sense? And what is this sense? This is not the Euclidean distance. This is the product of the difference between the coordinates. Um, and this is actually quite natural when you think of it from an algebraic number theory um, interpretation. It's a norm, it's algebraic norm. Um, and this is what I suspect led Minkowski to make this conjecture, if indeed he made this conjecture. Uh, and you want to say that this is at most 2 to the minus n. So let me show you by picture what, what this uh, uh, how, what this looks like in two dimensions. So this is the body of all points whose distance, this norm distance, uh, which is not really distance, but it's, its norm from, from zero is at most one quarter. So one quarter is the bound is two to the minus n, n is two here. So in this case, two is really two. It's, it's not a computer science two. Uh, so this is the body he wants uh, to use. Um, this is the set he wants to use, this, this star set. And what he wants to say is basically, if you take this set and move it all over, use all uh, lattice points as centers, you'll cover space. It's a covering statement. So here's, you see what it looks like. So you take the set and move it everywhere, place one around each lattice point. Okay, a few more. And I hope this convinces you, this really covers space. So all points in Rn, in this case R2, all points in the plane got covered. Okay, so I think so. Um, and you, so, so this is the conjecture. Again, the conjecture is a way to cover Rn. You can cover all points in Y are going to be within distance 2 to the minus n of some lattice point x. Okay, that's that's Minkowski conjecture. Um, you can see this is tight for Zn. Again, we have Zn showing up, the boring lattice, Zn. This is tight because if you take Zn and you take Y to be the all one half vector, then no matter what x you take, those differences are always at least one half. So this you know, will never be strictly smaller than 2 to the minus n. So this is tied for Zn. You cannot hope for anything smaller than 2 to the minus n. But is it actually true? And that's, that's a big question. So we, we don't know the answer, but let me tell you what we do know. So Minkowski already knew that it's true in two dimensions. So what I showed you in the picture, there's a reason it works, because the conjecture is true in two dimensions. He proved it already a long time ago. Um, so some uh, 30 years later, Remak showed that it's true also in three dimensions. Um, Dyson showed in uh, 48 that it's true in four dimensions. Nice paper. Um, uh, and uh, Skubienko extended this to five dimensions in 1976. And I would say some kind of uh, big uh, jump in the understanding of the problem came with McMullen's work in 2004. Actually, I think McMullen uh, gave the other lecture a few years ago. I'm not sure if he mentioned this. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute um, uh, what exactly he proved, but he was able to prove it in dimension six. But it's not just proving it, but also he proved something fundamental that allowed uh, much more progress on this question to be made. Uh, indeed, in the, in the years following McMahon's work, this was proved in, in seven dimensions, worked with Hans Gill, Raka, and, and Semi. And this was, was a paper, a nice paper, 23, 23 pages. Um, for two years later, same group proved it in eight dimensions, a 50 page paper. And um, then a uh, slightly different group, <laughs> uh, nine dimensions in 100. So can anyone guess what's next? <laughs> so yeah, Katuria and Raka proved it in uh, nine dimensions. It's a very long paper, lots of cases, lots of case analysis. And what's next? Well, we don't know. It's not yet proven in 10 dimensions. Um, but extrapolating, it's not going to look very good if we continue this way. So I'll tell you, tell you what I mean by this way. So this is, this is a. Uh, all those, almost all those papers use a technique or an approach by Remak and Davenport, and here's the idea. The basic idea is really knowing to work with those stars. Those stars are really not nice. Um, they're not convex, really painful to work with, so let's replace them. Instead of covering with stars, let's cover with the ball inside. Okay? And if we can cover with the ball, with the ball covered space, surely the star also covers the space. Maybe we don't need this whole star, just work with the ball inside it. So this was the basic idea. Of course, very natural idea to replace the star with a nice uh, ball. And here's what it looks like. 
Oh, that didn't work. Okay. So there are holes. If you can see, there are holes left here and here and here and here. Even though I took a determinant one lattice, it is a determinant one. You can you can check. So what went wrong is that, well, of course, you cannot hope to cover any determinant one lattice using balls because determinant one lattice can be extremely sparse in some directions. It can be dense in one direction, extremely sparse in some other direction. So what Remak and Davenport actually said is not this. This, was, this is too naive. You cannot hope to cover any determinant one lattice this way. What they said is this. First, what they observed is something very simple. They observed that this is invariant under volume preserving scaling of the axis. Because we're just multiplying all the coordinates, we could scale the first coordinate, like squeeze it by a factor two, and expand the second coordinate by a factor two, and this product remains the same. Nothing happens to the product. So the left hand side is invariant under those transformations. I can compress one axis and maybe uh, expand the other. Uh, as long as the product is one, nothing happens <coughs> to this product. And this leads to the following idea. Let's take any lattice of determinant 1 and find some diagonal transformation, some diagonal A of determinant 1. So basically, I'm specifying a number for each axis, how much to uh, expand it or, or compress it, um, such that the covering radius of the new lattice of A times L after compression is at most square root, square root n over 2. So covering radius just means you can cover, cover it by balls of radius square root n over 2. I should have said this ball inside the star is of radius square root n over 2. You can compute it. It's, this is the ball you get. So that's the idea. The idea is to take an arbitrary lattice of determinant 1, move it, maneuver, uh, uh, you know, massage it a bit, and get, get a new lattice, AL, for which you can cover it with balls. And then you're happy. So maybe there's something wrong with the lattice you started with, but you can change it uh, and, and make it work. So let's try it here. I start again with the same lattice we had before. It, it didn't work. It work with the balls. So we'll change it a bit. So I'm expanding x-axis, compressing the y-axis. Now this looks good. Let's try. It works. OK? So this was the approach, the Remark, uh, Davenport approach, uh, but still not precise enough. How exactly do we do? When, when do we know where to, when to stop? How do we know when to stop, right? You can, there are lots of ways of doing it, especially in n dimensions. Here there's only one parameter in, one, in two dimensions, but in n dimensions, you have n minus 1 parameters. When should you stop? And actually, they said they had a concrete plan of how to do that. And let me show you. What they suggested doing is finding a position of the lattice when it's well-rounded. They wanted to make the lattice well-rounded. And well-rounded means that its shortest vectors span n-dimensional space. So you have n linearly independent vectors in the lattice that are all short. And this was the idea that Remak and Davenport suggested. And it was proven in several uh, special cases, several dimensions. Dyson proved it, say, in four dimensions. But what McMullen showed in 2004, and Omri Solan proved it recently in full generality, is that you can actually always do that. So th this, this part of the Remak Davenport program has been solved. So we know that we can always take a lattice of determinant 1, and we can always massage it in this way to make it well-rounded. So let me show you what it means to be well-rounded. So here is the lattice. Um, and now it's not well-rounded, because there's only one um, shortest vector. Of course, there's also this guy, but it's still only one dimension. The span is only one dimensional. What I want to do, I want to transform it until at some point, if you saw at some point, you get two shortest vectors and they span two dimensional space. Now I can try to pause it, but it never works. It's really hard to, let's, let's see. Yep, I'll get it next time I get it. OK. Oh, worked first time. Great. <laughs> so you have two vectors, and they're both the same length, both shortest, and they span RN. OK, so this was the idea of Remak and Davenport. What they said is that let's find a position where it's in this form. And now we know it's possible. We know we can. Yeah, yeah. The diagonal action, the orbit under diagonal action, should hit the, sta the stable set, the sta set of stable lattices. So after you have this, now we know that this will always be done. There's always such a diagonal action that brings you to a well-rounded position. You will have n vectors uh, that generate that, that span R n. The only thing you have to prove is this. And this is a conjecture by Woods from 1972, and it says that whenever you're well-rounded, the covering radius is square root on over 2. You can really cover by balls of radius square root on over 2. So if this is true, we're done. Because Minkowski's conjecture follows from this. Because we know we can take any lattice, we can transform it, bring it to the right form, to the form where it's well-rounded, and we apply this conjecture, and we get that we can cover it by balls of radius square root on over 2. 
Okay. And indeed, this is what most of the work I showed you actually did. So we know that this is true. We know that Wood's conjecture is true in dimensions up to nine. So this work of 132 pages proved that this is true. This Wood's conjecture is true in dimension nine. Any lattice, any nine-dimensional lattice, if you look, um, if it's well-rounded, if its shortest vectors generate R9, then it can be covered by borders of radius square 10 over 2. So this is good news, except you know, when, when papers get more <laughs> longer and longer, maybe you should start asking yourself if it's really true. And unfortunately, it's not. So what we showed last year with uh, Shapira and Weiss is that it's um, simply not true. Wood's conjecture uh, is not true once you go in dimension 30, potentially even lower. The best we could get is 30. Um, it's like a one-page uh, paper. Uh, I think the journal wasn't very happy about it being so short, but they agreed to accept it anyway. <laughs> so basically, the, the, the Remak Davenport approach seems to fail, and maybe we're back in the square one, square zero. And what, what, one thing we can do, maybe, to salvage it is to use the following theorem by uh, Shapira and Weiss. So the idea to salvage the approach is maybe this well-rounded notion was not the best notion uh, to use. Maybe we should replace it with something else. And um, stable is the, the set we should be using. So what Shapira and Weiss did, and it follows the same proof uh, idea of McMullen, um, is something almost identical. They show that you can take any lattice and you can transform it in to a stable lattice by, again, the same transformation. So no longer well-rounded, you can find in the orbit a stable lattice, not a well-rounded one. And therefore, now we have a new conjecture. And even though Shapira and Weiss explicitly asked me not to uh, uh, credit this conjecture to them, uh, so this is a conjecture not made by Shapira and Weiss. Um, <laughs> the covering radius uh, of any stable lattice is at most square root n over 2. And if we could prove that, we'll be done. We'll get Minkowski conjecture finally. And what do we know about that? Well, I think it's known up to dimension 7, I think. So your counter example is in the same wavelength? Well, the counter, yeah, it's embarrassingly simple. <laughs> Basically, you so want... Why does it not work yet? Oh, for fundamental... So well-rounded is not a nice notion. Yeah, basically, the counter example is just direct sum of two lattices. Right. You take Zn and you take a nice uh, leech-like lattice, and that's going to work. Um, but stable is... A, much nicer notion. Stable applies to all sub -lattices. You cannot hide things because stable sees everything. It goes into all sub lattices, all subspaces. So here is again the conjecture they, they never made. Uh, and what do we know about this conjecture? Um, well, now this is the connection to the reverse Minkowski. So what we can say are two things. To the first, for some reverse Minkowski, we show that for stable lattices, the covering radius is, well, not square root 1 over 2, but it's at most square root 10 times log to the 3 halves n. That's unfortunate. To get Minkowski's conjecture, we really need square root 1 over 2, but it's getting there, at least at the right ballpark. For Woods's conjecture, it was way off. I mean, Woods's conjecture, there are counterexamples that are asymptotically approaching n, or n over log n, uh, whereas the hope was to get square root n. Here, here it's at least in the right ballpark. Uh, the second thing we can show uh, and this also uses a recent uh, result by Magazinov, is, is that this conjecture of Shapira and Weiss actually would follow from a celebrated conjecture uh, in the convex geometry known as the Stysing conjecture, or to be precise, a strong form of it. Now, this is one of the main conjectures in that area uh, of high dimensional convex geometry. I cannot, uh, I won't say much about it, but it's, it's one of those conjectures that are obviously true, but still incredibly hard to prove. Um, the conjecture says something like, if you take any body, any convex body um, in high dimensions and has volume one, there's a way to slice it such that the slice has volume constant, at least some constant volume. So this is, this is basically a slicing conjecture. And here's an example. You take a cube, and there are several ways to slice a cube. You can do it like this horizontally. Then this is a slice. It has area one. Uh, you can do it also diagonally like this, and you get area square root two. And you can also do it like that. You get a hexagon. It has area square root 2 over 2. So the, in this case, this would be the largest area. Um, in fact, this is the best you can do in any dimension. This is a result of ball. This is the best way to slice a cube. It's actually this in all dimensions. But, but the slicing conjecture is really about general bodies, not about the cube. Um, and we're hoping that you know, if, you have a, if you have a right answer there, uh, you could resolve Minkowski conjecture. But uh, this. Um, Something I'm hoping, yeah, 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 
will be solved at some point. So this is still a work in progress. Uh, so questions? Um, so this is kind of where things stand with the reverse Minkowski. And uh, what I want to do in the remaining minutes, just to tell you a bit about something completely different. Okay, so now you can wake up or, or fall asleep if you don't care about this, but it's cryptography. And this is why you know, many of us uh, care a lot about lattices and, and got us into this area in the first place. Um, and specifically, I'd like to tell you about how cryptography gets together with lattices and maybe some quantum computation in there too. So, so maybe I started with the very basics. Cryptography is everywhere these days. Uh, you know, it's been like that for a while with the Enigma machine, but now it's even more in our daily lives. Each time you connect to the Gmail or to bank, so you really want cryptography um, for uh, authentication, for for encryption, for many many tasks in daily life. Uh, cryptography is necessary. Um, how is um, how does it work? Well, usually when you connect to a website, there's something known as public key encryption. That's one of the, I think, most remarkable uh, discoveries in the 20th century. That this thing, these things actually exist. So Diffie and Hellman uh, first to discover it in, in the public uh, in 1976, but turns out this was declassified in the end of the 20th century. The British intelligence already knew that three years earlier. Um, and, but the, the idea is to, um, uh, allow two parties to communicate without ever having agreed on a secret. So I can, you know, I can now take one of you and just transfer to you uh, a secret message, even though everyone else is listening. That's something you can do. That's what you do every day when you connect to your bank, because, uh, or Gmail. I think you never went to Google headquarters and got some secret key. You just communicate over Gmail. Anyone can listen, you know, T-Mobile or whatever, Verizon, they, they can listen, they probably do, but they can't tell what's in there because you're using public key encryption. So even though everyone is listening, you can still send secret messages. See it? <laughs> well, maybe, not to me, but maybe that is to you. OK, so most systems in, uh, currently in use are based on something like the RSA crypto system. And what is the RSA crypto system or other systems like that? They're all based on the problem that uh, we like a lot, and it's called factoring integers. It's 15 is uh, 3 times 5, 21 is 3 times 7, 55 is 5 times 11. 1943 is a bit more difficult, it's, it's 97 times 19. And as numbers get bigger, this seems to be a hard problem. And if you have something like that, um, more than 200 digits, that's roughly the limit of what computers can do these days. Um, so this is the largest, roughly the order of magnitude of numbers that computers can factorize in, you know, in, uh, in reasonable time. Of course, you don't wait 2,000 years. You do it in parallel on, on 2,000 computers. But it's still, this takes huge amounts of effort to do. And that's roughly the limit of computers today. Uh, and this, the fact that this seems to be a hard problem is, um, is used a lot in cryptography. It's not NP-hard, um, for those of you uh, who know about complexity. But the best known algorithm, until one of you discovers a better one, and I encourage you to do so, uh, runs in time that's exponential in the cube root of a number of digits. <laughs> So as the d numbers get bigger, this becomes very slow. So 200 digits, 200 decimal digits is roughly the limit. Um, and nowadays, almost all secure communication is based on this or variants of this on the similar. So it's very monolithic. It's all based on this one uh, idea of factoring integers or related problems, related number theoretic problems. And why is that the problem? Well, this is a crisis that might be looming, is a crisis started in 1994, where Shor discovered that this task of factoring, factorizing integers is actually easy for a quantum computer. So if you take uh, a quantum computer, I don't know if you have one here at the Institute, but if you do have one, you can use it to factorize, in principle, numbers that are very long, very big. Um, and quantum computers can actually break almost all cryptographic codes that are in use today. So the only caveat is that we actually don't have those quantum comp computers yet. Uh, this is a story from a couple of weeks ago. Um, the IBM, uh, they have a new quantum computer. I was actually there two weeks ago. And now it's, they, can do 50, they, can, they can do 50 qubits, 50, uh, 50 quantum bits. Seems that the progress is um, slowly uh, you know, picking up speed. Uh, it's not clear if we'll have it in the next 10 years, uh, full quantum computers that can factor as numbers, but maybe. So, you know, so what's going to save uh, the world and humanity? Um, no, not Superman. Uh, you guessed it. Yeah, lattices. So lattices, we think, lattices might be the future of cryptography. Um, and it's 
currently becoming a real concern because of progress with quantum computers. Um, and uh, historically, lattices have been used in cryptography, but usually as a way to attack, to break cryptographic schemes. That was done already in the 1980s, and until this day. There was actually a recent attack a few weeks ago, the return of the Coppersmith attack, if you've heard of it. But in 1996, what I tied realized that maybe we can use lattices to do something positive, to build cryptography, a cryptographic scheme, not just to break cryptography. So I suggested that maybe lattices can be a way to hide messages. So I'll just roughly show you what the idea is, what Aitai's idea was. Um, and here's the basic idea. If you take a lattice, it has several, it has many bases, many possible bases. Here's a particularly nice one. That's the one we love because it's made of short vectors and they're almost orthogonal. This is a very nice basis. But the lattice has lots of bases. And here's another basis of the same lattice. It's made of two very long vectors and they're very close together. And Aitai's idea was this. Maybe I can come up with a lattice and I come up with this nice basis because I choose the lattice myself. I will choose this nice basis. But I will not tell anyone about this basis. I will not tell you what this nice basis is. This is only for me. It's my secret basis. And what I'll do, I'll send you this. I'll send you this terrible description of the lattice. Now, with this terrible description, you can still do things like you can combine, you can add vectors together, and you can come up with other lattice points. In particular, you can pick one of those lattice points and use this as a message. So maybe this message says yes, this is no, this is maybe. We can assign some meaning to any point here in the lattice. And you can use that vectors to um, come up with a message. Now, what you do next, you don't want to send this vector as is. What you do, you take this vector and move it a little bit. So if you want to send me a message, that, while everyone else is listening, you take a point here in this lattice um, that corresponds to some message, maybe yes or no, and you just move it a little bit randomly, just add some random shift to it. And that's what you send to me. So what's the idea? The idea is that I, as the receiver, I have the good basis here. Because I came up with this lattice in the first place. I'm the only one who knows this good basis. And what I can do now, well, it's very simple. I'll just write this point I received. This is what's being sent, the, the, kind of the coordinates of this point in Rn. I just write this point in this basis. I just express this point as a linear combination of these two points. And what I'm going to get uh, it's like maybe 0 0.8 of this vector here, v1, and maybe 1, 2, 3, or 3 3.2 of the other vector. And what I can do, I can just round the coordinates to the nearest integer. And once I do that, I'll recover the message. This is the message. And I know you want to send me yes. Now, everyone else listening, they don't know this basis. They know some terrible basis of the lattice. And apparently, it seems like this is a very hard problem, given a bad description of a lattice, to map this back into that. Seems like a very hard problem. And in fact, the best known attacks, the best known algorithms to do that require time that's exponential in dimension. So we don't do this in two dimensions. Here it's obvious. This point you can map back to here. You do it in 200, 300 dimensions. That's where it gets much more difficult. And the best known algorithms require time 2 to the n. And luckily, there are no better quantum attacks known. So even if a quantum computer is built, it's far as, as far as we know, it won't help. It won't help in attacking those schemes. These schemes might be made secure also when IBM uh, completes the, the first quantum computer. The modern lattice-based crypto uh, has evolved a lot. Nowadays, there are hundreds of papers uh, in it's all, all the major conferences. Um, the, the main advantage is, is like it's believed to be secure against quantum computers, as I mentioned before. But surprisingly, in recent years, we realized it has many other advantages. Um, one of them, it's extremely versatile. It can do lots of things that we just didn't know how to do before. So there are certain cryptographic tasks, like this one here that was in the news some years ago, fully homomorphic encryption, um, that allows basically uh, to compute things in the cloud, encrypted, compute on encrypted data. And this, this, was, this is something that we don't know how to do in any other way. We have to use lattices to do that, similarly for some other tasks. Um, it's, extremely efficient, especially now uh, algebraic number fields, uh, algebraic number theory is used in some of the constructions. Those are lattices coming from ideals in algebraic uh, number fields. And thanks to that, um, those efficient constructions are actually hopefully going to be implemented in, in all your cell phones. Currently, Google tried it in the Chrome browser. Uh, it's, it's implemented as a kind of beta version. Uh, it seems to work. And 
Um, the National Institute of Standards is hopefully going to make this a standard in, 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 in the near future. So that's hopefully what the future holds is based crypto. So um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll probably stop there and take uh, questions. Hey, thank you. To be hard enough? Yes. Uh, it, depend, it depends on exactly how much you also move the vector, but I think a safe number would be a few hundreds, maybe 400. There, um, there are some algorithms that work quite well until they mention 100, uh, like the LLL algorithm, the uh, lensa lensa lovas algorithm. It works pretty well, but after they mention 100, 200, it seems to become exceedingly hard, um, as far as we know. <laughs> Right. Neither is this. Yeah. Unfortunately, we cannot base, as far as we know, we cannot base cryptography on NP-complete problems. So this problem is I not NP-complete. Right yeah, if you really want the shortest, but this is not the true shortest. Yeah, this is a slightly different problem because the vector is already quite close to the lattice. Um, and this is a question we don't, yeah, we don't have, we don't believe is NP-complete, but it's, uh, it seems to be hard nevertheless. I mean, it might. I think we, we tried a few places to use it, yeah. Um, one of the problems we have, yeah, trying to understand those Voronoi cells. So those Voronoi cells have some interesting features, but we don't understand them well enough. So, you know, it might, you know, understanding them more can come from several different directions. Yeah, it might, might be useful. Uh, we know the number of faces they have. We, we know things like that, but not enough about their uh, geometry. Also the discrete one. Correct, correct. So one